AI-enabled company different from companies that aren't using AI? What benefits do leaders stand to gain if they do enable their business with AI? And if Guns N' Roses can take advantage of this new technology, why can't you? Hi, I'm Courtney Baker, and this is AI Know How, helping you reimagine your business in the AI era. As always, I'm joined by Knownwell CEO David DeWolf, Chief Strategy Officer Pete Buer, and Chief Product Officer Mohan Rao. We also have a discussion with Dimitri Shapiro of UAI to talk about how his company is helping democratize access to creating AI applications. But first, the news. joins us as always to break down some of the latest AI headlines and how they apply to your business. Hey, Pete. Hi, Courtney. How are you? Doing good. Okay, Pete, let me be the first to say welcome to the jungle. <laughs> <laughs> the first headline this week is Guns N' Roses welcome you to their animated AI nightmare in Trippy the General video. Pete, is there any kind of takeaway for business <laughs> leaders in this story? any chance to talk about Guns N' Roses. I'm going to do you a favor, Courtney, because I like you, and I'm not going to bust out into my best Axl Rose. <laughs> but of course, Guns N' Roses is uh, kind of my vintage, and I will share the secret that they may have featured prominently in my wedding playlist. Nice. But I think that's the segue, uh, that you can, in fact, uh, teach old dogs new tricks if Axel and Slash can get themselves onto the AI train, so too can the rest of us. Um, it's definitely worth checking out the video. Set aside the fact that it's a new release, a fast release from a band that took 10, more than 10 years to produce its last album. It's just cool. And as you say, it's trippy. It's uh, this blend of uh, live footage and AI artistry. Uh, we would have referred to it as mixed media in the past, but nowadays when AI is involved, we refer to it as multimodal, right? And so um, that's the takeaway for listeners. Multimodal is sort of the next wave of uh, practical pragmatic AI. Um, essentially, it pulls together um, multiple different types of data with multiple different types of processing algorithms to give you the absolutely richest rendering of whatever the concept or object or output is that you're trying to produce. Um, multimodal is the next era for large language models. I think before we know it, it's going to be the default. Uh, and hats off to the boys in Guns N' Roses for putting us onto it this week. I think we can all agree that we're looking forward to their next album, Use Your Hallucination. <laughs> 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 uh, next up, New York Times published an article titled Hottest Jobs in Corporate America, The Executive in Charge of AI. Not that long ago, there was a question being banded about internally here, which was, is it time for companies to appoint a chief AI officer? Apparently for some, the answer was yes. Pete, what are your takeaways here? Well, as we all learned in... Uh, the leadership development class focused on organizational design, you quote unquote organize around what's hard, right? And making sense of the AI wave that's crashing on the beaches of all businesses is surely that. The question for me though becomes how to organize around this what's hard. For some companies, it might be a dedicated executive in the C-suite called a chief AI officer. And the article references a few cases uh, where this has been the choice. So 400 federal agencies responding to President Biden's executive order. Sure. A uh, big consulting firm selling AI expertise and advice. Having a chief AI officer looks really good on paper in your pitch deck, right? Healthcare companies were getting work done across silos is next to impossible. Having a silo buster with that title, I think makes sense. But I think also in other cases, a dedicated uh, senior most AI officer might not necessarily be the only answer, um, at least not out of the gates. 
And in our work with customers, we've seen a lot of um, flavors of organizational approach to getting after the AI transformation challenge. In operationally heavy businesses, a talented COO often gets the mandate to, um, to run with it. Um, in other cases, we've seen AI task forces, cross-functional groups, uh, or uh, head of HR plus head of ops plus head of uh, technology on the job. And there are other businesses out there that are already building, deploying, buying AI day in and day out. Do they need a chief AI officer? Unclear, right? So I think the big thing um, on this question is to first assess where you are on your AI journey and uh, the degree to which and how AI is going to most um, seriously impact uh, strategy. And with that knowledge, then make the decision about the right way to organize. I think it's also an interesting time to make sure we don't default to we're going to hire this role in that we all as executives are really pursuing our own knowledge and understanding of the platform because we don't know. It may be you um, at the table that needs to be the voice for how AI is going to be deployed in your organization. Beautiful. Yep. Pete, thank you as always. Thank you, Courtney. Love it. <laughs> yeah, my favorite click. <laughs> We talk a lot on this show and here at Knownwell in general about how AI can be used to help leaders run their companies far more effectively than they do today. I sat down with David DeWolf and Mohan Rao to get their perspective on what an AI-enabled company might look like. David, Mohan, how are you? I'm great today. How are you? I'm doing good. Mohan, you good? Good. Doing really good. Yeah. Doing Thanks good. for asking. Okay. Yeah. Full disclosure, everybody. I just like totally butchered the intro the first time. So these two are just um, really having bad. to live through the second time. <laughs> so if we're awkward, that's why. Uh, welcome to the show. So David Mohan, in our last episode, we talked about the AI imperative. How important is it right now to start driving towards you know, implementing the technology within our businesses. But today I wanted to kind of flip that coin to the other side. And I wanted to talk about what exactly an AI enabled company looks like. Can you help us craft what we're thinking of, what we should be thinking of when we think of an AI enabled company? So again, We've talked about the different horizons and tried to help executives understand we're going to move well past just this execution layer. But what does that actually look like? So I just want to throw that out to you. And, and can you help us imagine what that type of company looks like? The way you think of this is no matter what business you're in, if you can know digitally what's going on in the runtime of your company, that is an AI-enabled enterprise. Right. So you may be uh, brewing beer uh, and, you know, the exact temperature of whatever is the process and, you know, the timing and, you know, when it needs to go from stage two to stage three. Right. That's a completely analog process. But that world in real time is being represented digitally. And for you to be able to measure that, not only the manufacturing process, but also in the sales and marketing process and all of the processes in the company that is an AI enabled enterprise and that allows you to do many other things. I like that answer. I, I would answer this um, probably a little bit differently. Um, I, I would go from the perspective of first answering the question, what do we mean by intelligence? And to me, intelligence is the ability to learn and apply knowledge, right? That's what's different about artificial intelligence from previous types of compute. We now have the ability for these computers to learn, to actually get better at something, to know more, and then to apply it. And so a fully AI-enabled business to me, um, kind of taking it one level up from what Mohan was saying, I think that's what it looks like practically, but almost philosophically, I think what it is is a business which really relies on computers to help it learn more, 
whether it's about their customers, about the market, about the exact work that's happening, and then apply that knowledge to continually improve and get better and get better and get better and get better. Um, and in doing that, I think to Mohan's point about really knowing and understanding the data and monitoring all of that, what an AI empowered business does, it allows us as human beings, as leaders to do what only we can do right right now. The the work of that learning and applying that knowledge is a lot of work that we have to do that gets in the way of actually having connection and relationship and inspiring our people and doing those things creatively and consciously that only we can do. And I think the best of both worlds of us being able to focus on what's truly human combined with leveraging the computers to learn and apply knowledge and continually improve our business is the epitome of, of what I think we're striving for. So would you say, I think probably for both of your examples, you're looking for proactive intelligence coming back from your technology that's you know running in your organization, that that's a key piece of being an AI enabled company? Exactly. Let me give you a couple of examples of how that would manifest. Business often is about balancing the constraints you have and the opportunities you seek, right? So that's what business is. Uh, and if you can know in real time what the constraints are and what the probabilistic success of the opportunities that you may have are, that's going to give you such a leg up, uh, right? So And be able to make those human decisions because you have better micro predictions, if you will, in the business context. That is an AI-enabled enterprise, be able to do that. Another example would be be able to run experiments, uh, right? So you have a multi-territory business. You want to be able to run something pricing somewhere uh, and run like 10 experiments uh, concurrently and see what happens, right? You can do that in a business of sort that we are talking about and be able to get take the small bets, see what worked, what didn't work, and bring it back in and make the right human decisions uh, for your business. Th those are two examples of how what David said could uh, work. David, I want to ask you to kind of pull back just a little bit and explain something you wrote about in a recent blog post. The blog post was about what is... AI as a service. But in that post, you started to break down compute the different types of intelligence. And I think it might be helpful for this conversation because, you know, mm -hmm. even when you take Mohan's original example, it's hard for those of us that aren't technologists to understand, oh, that kind of sounds like something that could have happened previously. Mm -hmm. And but without the knowledge of these different types of intelligence, it's just hard to distinguish. What is this something we could have done? It seems like something we might have been able to do five years ago. Or, you know, yeah. why could can you help us break that down? Yeah, I think it goes back to this idea of of learning and applying, right? So when I think about the different types of of knowledge um, and and intelligence, I, I start with just computation, right? What computers have been able to do, right? Computers compute computation, right? Historically, has been about recalling from memory, right? Actually looking something up and finding it, and then computing with it, meaning adding it together, doing mathematical and geometric equations with that, where frankly, there's only one answer, right? One plus one is always two. Two plus two is always four. And computers have been really, really good at doing that type of math, um, algebraic and geometric equations and those types of things, right? Um, and, and from that, they've been able to assist us in expediting and automating in a very deterministic fashion, as, as Mohan says. What's new is we now have this level of inference, right? So after computation comes inference, which is it's an action of rational deduction, right? It is us looking at factual data, looking at kind of reasoning and being able to 
infer a hypothesis, infer something that's justifiable out of the fact patterns and the the rationale that we have. And oftentimes the answers to those questions don't actually have a black or white certain answer, right? It's not two plus two equals four. It is what is a good process for um, releasing new blog articles <laughs> or um, what is the draft of an upcoming press release that we're going to write? Or can we produce some software that will actually do some, there's different ways to go about those problems. And so that is inference. That's what we're doing now. I think the last thing that we're now on the precipice of as well is actually making judgments. Um, judgments are taking those inferences and then applying morals, ethics, values, um, essentially to those judgments. Um, now, a computer can't come up with those values and ethics and morals themselves by the computer, but given a set of values and ethics that we adhere to, it can take and intersect those with inference and start to make judgments about whether something is good or bad given those things, right? And so I think that's the next level that we're going to start to get to and see more of with AI now that it's here. But I think understanding those things and then starting to apply it back to business can be really helpful helpful, right? So you can see, okay, we used to automate things with deterministic logic. Now we're going to start to infer and have multiple possible outcomes, but have AI helped us select the right, the best one. And then you want to talk about ethical AI and some of the conclusions out there. You can actually look and start to make judgments. Um, you know, not just, is this the best thing for the business, but is it right or wrong, right? Given a certain set of values and those types of things. And so I think thinking about AI as it applies applies to the visionary company of the future, I think we should really look at it through that lens and understand those different types of compute. Yeah, I think I think systems in the past have been about describing what happened, right? By and large, it was a digital representation of what has already happened. Like you can like log in and see how many calls came in from this customer. That is something that had already happened and you, it's a nice log and it was it was great, uh, but it was describing things that happened in the past. What it was not giving us, as David said, making predictions about what may happen in the future, right? So that is the big difference between uh, the descriptive analytics that we've had for a long time and then the various stages of machine learning and AI journey that we are on is the ability to make these product predictions. So what I hear you say, as we start to think about the AI-enabled company of the future, you know, it's got proactive intelligence, you know, it's using inference at a really high level. It's even begun to have judgment on some of those inferences. What are, are there any other words you would add to what an AI-enabled company looks like? Yeah, one of the things that comes to my mind is there, there's so much focus right now on the co-pilots of the world, right? Whether it's mm -hmm. Microsoft's actual co-pilots or, yeah. the, or the other tools that are out there that are helping people do their work. Um, one of the really interesting analogies I think of is they are there here and now for workers actually doing their execution work. I think leaders, when you talk about businesses, leaders will have co-pilots helping them operate the business and doing their job more and more readily um, and starting to think about how does the compute actually run the business in partnership with a leader um, is a really interesting question that is a continuation of what you started there of, of thinking about businesses in the future. And, and what that can enable you is come up with new strategy, right? Things that you could not do previously that you can do next, right? So think about uh, an updated strategy for your business, potentially be able to enable new products out there for your customers. These are the types of practical things that can happen with AI in the enterprise of tomorrow. Well, I think this is really interesting, and I'm sure this will be a conversation that we continue on many episodes uh, ahead as we this picture becomes clearer and clearer over time. Mohan, David, thank you. Thanks. It was lots of fun. 
We've talked a lot today about what an AI enabled company looks like. And if you wanna experience one or wanna be on the cutting edge of getting this technology in your business, We've got good news. It's exactly what we're building here at Knownwell. Go to knownwell.com and you can join our beta wait list today. Dimitri Shapiro joined Pete Buer recently to talk about how his company UAI is helping democratize access to AI. He gives just a few examples of the types of applications companies are building using their tool, Mind Studio. Dimitri, welcome. So nice to have you. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm super excited to chat. For the benefit of the, the listeners, uh, I was hoping we could start with a little bit of background on uh, UAI and Mind Studio. Mm -hmm. uh, what does the world need to know? UAI is a company and Mind Studio is a product of the company. Uh, and Mind Studio is a, is a tool, it's a platform that allows anyone to learn to build and, and build what we call AI-powered applications to be able to take all of the power of ChatGPT and Anthropic Claude and you know, various models from Google and Meta and Mistral and open source, where it's model agnostic, so it supports all the major models, allow you to take all of those models and, and, and create applications for end users to use that leverage the power of those AI models. Uh, and uh, there are already over 13,000 uh, AI-powered applications that have been built and deployed using Mind Studio. They live in giant enterprises and government agencies and small and medium-sized businesses. Thousands of websites embed them on their websites. And so it's a really powerful uh, new tool that allows anyone to become a, a builder of AI, not just a user of AI. Do you have a favorite story you tell about the company that made the most difference, had the craziest ROI? Or You know, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to pick and also hesitate to uh, mention names, so I, I will sort of abstract them a bit. Yeah, of course. Uh, so there, there is a government agency uh, that is using this in their HR department to do a whole bunch of things for vetting of new candidates to work in the agency for uh, optimizing uh, a bunch of human resource functions, like automating things that used to be done by a bunch of people, but now sort of are done automatically, uh, for assessing individuals once they are employed at the agency, and also then training them. So AI mm -hmm. assessors and trainers that have been built, we're seeing that as a common pattern, so they're not the only ones, but it's kind of cool that a government agency sort of decided to use this startup <laughs> to build all of these internal tools for human resources. That seemed kind of like a, a thing. Um, same, I don't want to mention sort of the, the names of companies, but, you know, F Fortune 50 company that's using it in project management that discovered it. Uh, and then sort of, again, one person discovered it, impressed a bunch of other folks on their team. They got trained on their own and now want to participate in our certified developer training. In fact, we did our first cohort this past Saturday. So we're starting to certify developers. And again, when we use the term developer, you actually don't need to be technical. The skill you need to be, to be great at building AI powered applications is the ability to use natural language, you know, human language precisely and in a disambiguated way to be able to explain things clearly of what you want the AI to do and what you want it not to do and how it should react to different situations. That's the skill that's required. It doesn't require any, you know, any coding to do. Although if you can code or again, if you need to get somebody else to help you, you can also add code to these AIs and you can call any third party APIs, you know, any third party system, call your own on-premise, uh, in models for inference, there's like many things you can add if you know how to code. But again, for the vast majority of use cases, you never really write a line of code to do that. What's your stance toward stewardship of the human and human agency as we make available so many technology solutions that at some level, um, you know, run the risk of taking jobs away? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll answer it sort of uh, not from the perspective of Mind Studio, because Mind Studio itself sort of doesn't play a role in any of that. Right, We're just infrastructure yeah. that allows people to use these things. So I'll kind of go up one level and talk about AI in general, gener yes. specifically generative AI. Whenever, again, whenever a new technology shows up, uh, whether, you know, when we went from mainframes to, to business computers, personal computers, and then we went to mobile and we went to the cloud and we went to all of these things, uh, there are questions of, is it going to disrupt jobs? And the answer is yes, it does. My guidance counselor in high school, I started writing code in 1984 when I was 14 in high school. Mm -hmm. And so I was a computer nerd. Uh, twice, at least, that I remember, maybe even three times, suggested that a great career for me would be that of a typist. Typist used to be a profession. Right. People used to write things on paper and give it to the secretarial pool that would type it up on a typewriter. And so because I could type, I could be a typist. That job doesn't really exist. Although stenographer still does, which is kind of amazing. But OK, we got it. This is going to be even more disruptive, I think, than any of those other waves because of this new capability of this thing to sort of do the work of sort of white collar uh, knowledge workers. And um, so it is going to be disruptive. And I think, you know, we as a society need to uh, very quickly uh, figure out how we're going to deal with that because there's no way to stop it, right? right? Like you, you, you can't put this genie back in the bottle. But again, I, I believe that uh, that it will bring more positive aspects along with it than negative. Although in the near term, I think we have real vulnerabilities as people grok what AI can do, especially with things like you know disinformation. You know, we've got an election coming up. There are elections all over the world. Uh, disinformation uh, to a pop population that doesn't understand that some of these things are really easy to create uh, can, I think, wreak havoc, start wars and do all kinds of things. But I think if we can get past this phase, uh, we, we might survive. Yeah. <laughs> and my, my feeling is that is that companies play a big role here. Le leadership teams need to have a stance and a view on, you know, how they how they will look after uh, folks who are displaced and I see markets forming where people are trading labor as they make decisions to run mm -hmm. rifts and so forth. And there are good answers to be had. It just it has to matter. You know, Dimitri, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure and an honor to have you here. Yeah, likewise. Thanks so much for having me. David Mohan, as you remember, well, in a recent episode, I asked you to give predictions on some of the largest AI players and how many times they mention AI in their Q1 earnings call, right? You remember? I remember. Mohan said every answer was easy. He's like, ah, oh, that's, that's piece of cake. I can't wait to <laughs> well, see. Well, I have the results. Um, and I know everybody listening has just been counting down until they found out. So... All right, I'm going to start with Apple. Okay, David, you guessed 27 times. So Mohan, you guessed 18. So scared of this answer because they He's actually so brought it up intentionally. And I will say for everybody listening, these are unofficial reporting basically as getting in the transcripts, okay? So don't hold us to precise. <laughs> Don't make any we financial didn't decisions. We hired Deloitte to do an audit. I, I, no, I like where this is going. <laughs> All right. Here's the answer. Apple, good old Tim Cook, 15. Okay. That's, woo -hoo! Wow. Yeah. So um, technically... You're both over, but Mohan, you were the closest. So, all right, okay. Amazon. Yeah, David, you guessed 32. Mohan, you guessed 34, and it was 32. Dang! On the Whoa! Yeah. Congrats! Yes. I love it. <laughs> yes. All right, that, you can have the previous one. I'll take yeah. that. <laughs> okay, <laughs> next up, but Mohan, you were still really close too. Okay, Meta. David, you guessed 63, and you had a lot of, if, if you missed that episode, you had a lot of reasons why you guessed 63. Yeah. Uh, Mohan, you guessed 51. This mm -hmm. was the, uh, other than like hitting it on the nose, David, this is yeah. the only one that you were both under. Yeah. And uh, not by a small It was in the 70s, number. wasn't it? It was actually 87. 
No way. Oh yeah. Really? Yeah. So big jump wow. from Apple at 15 to Meta at 87. So okay. um, no, I didn't take again, into account the Senate hearings. Uh, so I guess that did it. <laughs> 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 well, it is interesting to look at, uh, you know, how they're talking about AI in the media. It's just interesting to kind of follow along as uh, this technology continues to evolve. David Mohan, thanks for having a little uh, fun. Next time you're show. competing with us, Courtney. That was fun. You're okay. joining the fray. All right. I'm here for that it. All fantastic. right. Thanks as always for listening and watching. Don't forget to review the show. It's really helpful for us and helps more people find us. As always, we like to ask one of our AI friends what they think about this episode. And today we're bringing in somebody new. So hey, Perplexity, welcome to the show. This episode, we're talking about what an AI-enabled company looks like. Can you help us out here? What do you think? An AI-enabled company leverages artificial intelligence to automate processes, make data-driven decisions, and create value from its knowledge and experience, enabling machines to operate independently within constraints to achieve a... And now, you're in the know. Thank you for watching and listening, and we'll be back next week with more headlines, roundtable discussion, and interviews with AI experts. 